Welcome to Plugged In, a podcast by ORMC about our co-op, our community, and our shared connections. I'm Michelle Hutchins, your community relations and and marketing uh, coordinator at ORMC. And joining me today are Marcus Skelton and Roger Sloan, two of our linemen. Well, Roger, you're a right-of-way coordinator from both working out of our Hilliard office. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Today, we're going to talk about what it is to be a lineman. A day in the life of a lineman. And um, April is the, the month that we normally have a National Lineman Appreciation Day. Uh, so I thought it was an appropriate opportunity to kind of shine a light on a job that from day to day may has its own challenges and, and may not draw as much attention. But certainly our members or consumers are very appreciative of your work. Uh, when as a shirt I saw recently said, when the lights go out, so do we. Um, you all work in some of the worst conditions, um, but I think just taking an opportunity to talk about the job, what it entails on a day-to-day, and that, yeah, the day might end at 5 o'clock, but if the storms roll in, you're rolling out, right. uh, so it's extending the day, and uh, to just kind of give an overview. So I guess, Marcus, so let's start with you. How long have you been a lineman? I've um, been uh, working for Okie Finoki for 22 years october will be 23 and uh been a lineman for probably 20 20 yeah. what you start as meter reader meter reader i did that for about two years so what what inspired you to make the jump from meter reader to line work mm. it was i guess it's, it was the next step it was natural progression natural yeah natural progression what attracted you to the work? I mean, it's hard work. It is. It's a uh, physical job, and, and uh, I like that. And just the uh, being able to be out doing the work and and uh, the excitement of it. The excitement of it. Okay, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Roger, how about you? How I, uh, you? I, I started on right away in May of 88. Uh and uh, made lineman in 94, so I've been actually been a lineman for about 28 years. And that was another natural pathway. Yeah. Many people that yeah. started at Okie Finoki. We always with... did. The young guys came in. We started on the right-of-way crew, and uh, you worked your way up from, uh, you know, grinding limbs to maybe a tree trimmer. You got to learn to run the bucket truck, and then you went from there, you know, depending on whether you went underground, overhead. You went into construction, and uh, that's what we did. We actually, I actually got the opportunity to be multi-crafted. So I was in the group, the first group to ever be trained on both underground and overhead. Oh, okay. Used to, it was just overhead lineman and then an underground lineman. But our group got trained as multi-crafted, so we, we did both. So that opened up a lot more doors for, for us guys, the apprentices that was in my group. And, uh, yeah. What, and so what about you? What motivated you to go into this line of work? Really just um, worked a job that was bad scheduling and got opportunity to come to the work at, at the co-op, and it's right there in our hometown. So you, you're working around people that you know. Um, you're out in the field working, and you, know, you, you might be at your neighbor's house or your grandmother's house or wherever. So, you know, just the fact of being in the community where we grew up and uh, – that was that was the main part of it. Now, one of the things people may not realize is the amount of time and training it, it, it takes to become a journeyman lineman. It isn't something you just you don't start on day one and start climbing poles and nope. and restoring power. And I and I and I think that is a bit of a surprise. It is quite the process. You want to talk about? The process because it's an OGT type of thing, but there's also the bookwork side of it as well. So the apprenticeship program is going to teach you the bookwork first, you know, and and uh, that's very important. But you know, to to actually learn the work, you can't do it without the, on the job training. I don't think you can anyway. I mean, it's That's, probably the most important part. And it's what four to five years. Yeah, it's four years. So, I mean, from what you said earlier, Roger, 
an apprentice starts from from the ground up. Walk me through that process a little bit. Well, um, when when we came through, we did we did the book work. It was done through uh, the Tennessee Valley uh, plan or whatever. I don't know what they're doing now. It's the Northwest. Yeah, line back then it was the Tennessee Valley plan, and we did the book work. You was given a book, and you progressed at your own pace through that book. But at the same time, you had to shuffle that around your work schedule. So, and back then, it was, it was, you worked every night, seemed like. So you didn't have a lot of time. So you had to work that book in and had to finish that book. And once you finish. Talk about what's in the book. I mean, the book is. Well, it is starts what? out in the beginning. It starts about the, ba- and just the basic electricity stuff. Oh, okay. Theory. The Electric theory, theory, the theory behind it. And then you, you, you work through the first book. And then when you finish that book. You had to be scheduled for a lab, and we'd go out of town for a week to a lab and do our test. We'd get, we'd pass, and once we passed, then we moved into book two. And then you just kept progressing. And they do, I think they do kind of the same now, but yeah. we do a lot of our book work with, in-house. Mm-hmm. Uh, they still go out of town for, for labs, labs, I think. Labs meaning demonstrating yep. you understand. Yeah. In and other you words, you go on, yes. your, your first, your first, your first one through the basics, you learn the basics of electricity and you learn how to use the climbing tools and you learn the tools and then you go to the climbing lab I and you spend you. a week climbing poles. That's all you do for the entire week is you climb poles and you do you do different chores, different different things off that pole. And then once you have proved to the point, okay, I can do that, then you get marked off and you move to the next one. So it might seem kind of interesting that, you know, Climbing is still a skill that has to be mastered yep. and it has to be tested and has to be um, recertified, so to speak. Um, because I think what most people see these days are people in the buckets. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of it is bucket work, but um, and 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 in in some situations we see the helicopter, <laughs> the helicopter work. But at the end of the day, there are just times and situations that you got to be able to get up that pole. You don't have any choice. Yeah. So what what are some of those situations? Uh, mostly storms, I would say. Uh, storm situations when the high water or, or roads are inaccessible. Or or, uh, or we got power lines in. We got power lines in places that you, you can't drive to. And depending on, you know, depending on the breakdown, mm-hmm. and we do, we, 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 good at, we good at figuring out a way not mm-hmm. to climb it. But when it needs climbing, we're going to go climb it. Sometimes it's just easier to go ahead and, 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 and do the work, climb the pole, and than it is to, you know. Maybe bog a truck down yeah. or, or have an issue, take a chance on uh, tearing up a customer's property. There's all kind of different issues involved in whether so, you, you yeah. know. So sometimes it's just a better option. Yeah, it's just a better regardless option. Regardless of whether there's a storm or not. That's mm-hmm. right. Okay. That's right. Um. Uh, so... I've I've seen you all climb, and you make it look easy. Um, you know the the tool looks very antiquated and outdated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does. Um, but it's obviously what works, and yeah. it hasn't changed a whole lot over the the years. How hard or easy is it to climb? It's not hard. Uh, you know, once you get the uh, the hang of it, you know, uh, it's just like climbing a ladder. It's- uh, well, and I mean, just we have a listening audience and we have a viewing audience. Um, so basically, you have a spike that you all attach to your boot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that spike you kind of jam, for lack of a better word, into the pole as you go up. And yeah, you, you sort of step, step up. Step up the pole like you would a ladder. And, and uh, you got to learn to trust your equipment. That's the main thing, I guess. That's, uh and once you get over the fear of it and the nervousness of it, you know, that, then you're kind of becomes a lot more relaxed. Kind of becomes second nature, but it does uh, it does get harder with age. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I can remember, you know, starting out as a young man, and it was easy. It was fun. Yeah, exciting. And, and Marcus actually done some rodeo stuff. You know, went and competed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, back then. It was. It was a whole lot easier. Uh, well, I've been to the now. rodeo once, so the, yeah. and the the and some of those men fly, yeah. fly up yeah. those poles. And it's changed a lot over the years with the uh, safety, you know, with the uh, fall restraints, yeah, the and, and everything and stuff like that. It's changed a lot. 
fall restraints were not right. standard equipment way back no, when? No, we used to we used to freehand. Freehand. We didn't. Mm-hmm. We we started at the ground with with two hands, like a like you see a squirrel climbing on a limb, and we just climb top of the pole and then put a safety on and go to work. We never. But now you have about. Now we have to start at the ground with a. With and so you a, use that strength. to help go up the pole as well, I yeah. guess, or it it's there to keep you from coming off the pole. You do. You can. You can still fall, but you're not going to hit the ground. Yeah. And so what? I know there's a term when your spike comes out of the. Cutting out. You cut, cutting out. I mean, because that can happen. It can slip. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. Well, there's all kind of objects on that pole. Every pole's got a pole ground. There's pole ground. There's staples. There's bolts. There's equipment. There's all kind of things on that pole that you got to maneuver around, uh, and for me personally, it was it's harder for me with the new equipment because I could maneuver around better before before we had started using the fall restraint. I gotcha. So now when you, you got to be locked in all the time, yeah. where before we didn't have to be, we could kind of just climb our way around. Well, and you're not just, okay. So you've got the spikes on your boots. You've got the the, the fall restraint, but you also have your tool belt. Tools and utility yeah. belt. What do you guys call it? Uh, your your belt. Belt that in yeah. general. Okay, now I, I th- that that thing is loaded down with tools. Yeah. The belt itself, empty, is not light, Mm-mm. and then load it down with tools because you essentially take as much as you can up with you. How how heavy is the belt itself? If you put it, if you put your regular hand tools in it, uh, and and belts will vary. Uh, you probably all together. You probably looking at somewhere around close to hundred pounds when you get it all. You know, get it all. Everything attached. Everything, to it. yeah. It's probably close to hundred pounds. So when you're going up a pole, it's you plus a hundred extra. Well, you got to figure that that hundred pounds is in position around your waist. Right. So it's in a spot where it needs you don't, to be. You're not. You don't feel like you're actually carrying. Yeah, you enough. don't feel like you're carrying. It's harder to tote it in the sack for me, <laughs> toting it to the pole, than it is to get actually get on the pole. Once I get it all on and get on the pole, it, it it's a whole lot better. Okay. Well, and that's not the only thing you're extra you're wearing. Um, you, you're going up with your, at what point do you go up with your gloves and your sleeves? From the ground. From the ground. Yeah. Depending on the situation. Most of the time it's, most of the time, most of the time it's gloves and sleeves from the ground. So with what you have on right now, this is standard issue uniform, That's fire right. resistant, fire retardant clothing. And I mean, you're just wearing it sitting here talking to me, but you wear it every day, mm-hmm. every day of the year, winter, spring, summer, fall, right. um, on yep. a 90 degree day, wearing what you have on, plus your gloves and sleeves. Tell me about that. <laughs> That's the hard part of the job. Uh, <laughs> you know, when... uh you know, I, I tell my guys, and and uh, so you you don't, in the summertime especially you don't get in the bucket with at least two bottles of water yeah. because if you get over get up there and get overheated, this not good. Yeah. It's, you know, nobody wants to have to be rescued, and you yeah. don't want to have to rescue. You don't want to be the guy that's got to be rescued, but yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough in the summer, especially just here the, here in southeast the, Georgia, yeah, northeast Florida. Just the clothes. Can, now, yeah. now, granted, if we're on the ground. If we're just running tickets or doing something, a lot of times we wear cotton T-shirts. Mm-hmm. We wear 100% cotton T-shirts. You'll see the guys in T-shirts um, while they're on the ground. But when you crawl in that bucket, it's FR all the way, long sleeves and gloves and sleeves. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's tough. It's uh, it's pretty nasty because uh, you can imagine, imagine putting your hand in a balloon and working for an hour. And then every time you raise your hand over your head, uh, sweat pours down your arm, down oh. your sleeve, and then your boots, and then the bucket, and it just oh, that it's, does it's sound pretty, lovely. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not a. <laughs> it's the unseen. See, this is why yeah, we're having this conversation. Exactly. This is the unseen part of the, the job. It that's is, why you stay out from underneath the bucket. That's why you stay out from under the guy. <laughs> I did not know that. And see? you'll see a lot of times you'll see you see him when he's taking a break. He's got the gloves off and they're hanging on the hook on the outside of the bucket, and they're upside down. Uh-huh. He's letting it drip. He's letting them drip, trying to. Well, and because it, but it's not your bare hand in that rubber glove either. You have on work gloves as well. No, no, your bare hand the goes in. Gloves. It is just, hand, it is yeah. just yes. your bare hand. Oh, okay, sorry. You got a pair of rubber it. gloves. You got the rubber and then the outside protector, and they go on top of the sleeves, which come up to your shoulders. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like so wearing I, an inner tube. That's right. Imagine I had putting it, an inner I, tube, an uh, inner tube on your arms. And across your back, and then 
going to the beach. Yeah. And the reason for that is when you're up in the bucket or up on the pole is you're up, you're up in the line mm-hmm. and it's, yeah. you know, you're moving around and in yeah. many, you know, you've got the tools, the extender tools in some cases, but in other, you're right up there against it. Most oh, of the yeah. time, if you're in the bucket, you're using your hands to, to work on whatever you're working on and not an, an extendable not, tool. Not an extendable tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And so you, I had my gloves mixed up, but yes, you wear a work glove on top of your, then mm-hmm. that's to protect the rubber. That's right. right. Cause you don't, you I don't mean, you need a, hole a hole in that. That would, that would not be that's good. That's bad. <laughs> exactly. So day to day, you know, just ready. You all work a full week, um, throughout the year doing maintenance, building system. Talk a little bit about what the, just the normal day to day work is that you all do. Day to day, uh, we're uh, hooking up new services, uh, redoing existing services, uh, extending lines, reconductoring, uh, things like that. That's our normal day to day, you know, and system it, maintenance, system type. maintenance, or either new construction, new construction. So just the regular business of delivering electricity. Yeah. And taking care of the ones that's there, you know. Everybody thinks, well, when a job's built, you know, you're done. Well, no, you're not done. You still got to maintain that line. Still got to take care of that that customer as years go by. Plus, you got to cut the right away. Mm-hmm. Got to keep that clean. Um, so yeah, it's um, my day to day is a little different than Marcus's. I right. do right away. So I uh, I cut right away during the day, and then I get to work with these guys at night, shooting trouble. And, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, we're 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 coming into thinking about preparing for storm season. You know, April, and May, and then we get to the summer. Um, it, it does seem it does seem as a general rule the storms don't don't come at noontime. No, <laughs> they do. It's usually five o'clock or yeah, later. It's usually a little after five. So that's the part people don't realize is okay. You've just worked your full day. It could be. In July, under the hot sun, you, you've sweated it out a couple of different times, and now you know we get our usual clouds roll in, atmosphere's hot, and and the storms unleash, so to speak. Could be at five o'clock, could be at eight o'clock, could be at midnight, and because of either wind or or um, lightning. lightning strikes yep. or or whatever, now you got a power outage, and you all need to go respond and talk a little bit about that talk about how how do you shift gears from system building to system repair and now we're talking now we're getting into the nitty-gritty of you all are working in some of the worst conditions talk to me about that i mean what motivates you (laughs) the customer for me for me it's the customer it's all about the customer because he's the one paying my salary He's dependent on me. Uh, you know, we live in the communities and we work in the community, so they they see us on a daily basis. They see that truck. They know they know our schedule. We get off. They see us go by. Yep, there's Roger going home. And then when the thunder lightning Rolls. comes in, <laughs> they see us roll out. And um, they they care about us. I mean, and they depend on us. And that's 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 really my drive. I just I just like being able to take care of the customers, and I love being able to do it in my hometown. How about for you, Marcus? I'm assuming it's similar. It's it's a lot, you know, a lot the same. Uh, it's the getting the job done and and uh, knowing your job and making sure that that the lights are on before we go home. You know, it's, it's that's that's most of the drive for me. It's always about safety first, obviously. Yeah. And so the, when there is an outage, your, your goal is to restore it as safely and as quickly as, mm-hmm. as possible. Um, but I also know that you, you don't wait till the rain stops and the oh, wind no. dies down. Um, that, you mean, you, you, if you did that, then... You'd be it, waiting it, the daylight before you got started <laughs> right. most of the time. That's right. And I mean, I know there have been times there was an Easter storm a couple years back that knocked out a good bit of things. I mean, that thing, mm-hmm. it was short and sweet, but it, it created a lot of havoc in the mm-hmm. process. And we had a number of members out 
Um, you know, and I think the last update we communicated was about eight o'clock on a Friday night. But by 6 a.m. Saturday morning, y'all had most of it on, except for the little things that yeah. you don't know are out until you get the big stuff out. Yeah, that's right. So what added challenges do you have to overcome at night and in a storm situation than if it was the middle of the day? For me, at my age, it's the vision. The nighttime, <laughs> glasses, lights, it's, it, I, I just, I struggle with this, with being able to see, because, you know, you're looking up the pole, you're looking in the woods, so I'm going to buy the, the best flashlight I can get, and we're going to go stomp in the woods and see if we can find it. How about you, Marcus? Uh, the, the fatigue, you know, because you've done work all day and and uh, just the challenge of working at night, you know. Uh, trying to find the problem. Trying to find the problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of the times it's uh, help, just getting uh, enough help to – to, to do the job that we need to do. Because sometimes you need to call out a tree crew, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. right? And that, so, but you might not know that till you get there. Somebody's got to lay eyes on it. Right. I mean, things have improved greatly mm -hmm. with our SCADA system and, oh, yeah. and pinpointing where an outage is. But at the end of the day, you still have to find it and figure out what the root cause is. And a lot of times it could be trees. So it mm -hmm. does require our contract crews to assist us. Mm -hmm. One of the things you... You've sort of alluded to, but you haven't touched on, and I'd like you to talk about, because I know there is a brotherhood among all of you in each of our offices. I mean, you you know what? You're, as linemen, your life is in the hands of those working with you. Not just yours, but those working with you. Talk to me a little bit about the closeness that you all have the trust that you have in one another, because I, I know that is very strong. Well, we spend as much time, probably more time with the guys that we work with than we do with our own families. You know, I mean, we spend days and nights and sometimes in motel rooms and, you know, we eat and play and joke. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's hard not to have a relationship yeah. with someone that you spend that much time with, you know, and if you don't have a brotherhood or a kinship of some kind, mm -hmm. it's hard to pass the day, I guess. Well, most of the time, the ones that, that, that don't get that involved, don't stay long. If you know what I'm saying? Sure. Sure. Because we, you know, we might not hang out at each other's house, but we, we do, but we do. <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, we see, we see each other more, you know, I mean, we, we all time well, but, during you know, the day at night time, and then you go off on a storm to help somebody else, and you might be sleeping in a truck together or sleeping in a motel room. Or, oh, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. That's the other part of the story, and you alluded to it, is when, when we are prepping for a storm, you know, it's not just all of our guys, all hands on deck. It is bringing in tree crews. It is bringing... That's right. Um, mutual aid from our, our sister co-ops, whether it be across Georgia, Florida, or Tennessee, Alabama. They've come from everywhere. Come I think one year it was from Iowa even mm -hmm. for the ice storm. Um, but you, we as well do the same. That's right. We go when needed. And and I know in the last couple of years, there's been several trips to Louisiana, mm -hmm. Alabama, the north part of Georgia, Kentucky, Kentucky in yeah. a snowstorm and an ice storm. Um so that's a whole added layer of to the to the job in that you're somewhere else's territory, but those relationships are critical, I would assume. Mm -hmm. um, just talk to me about that. You know how how that changes. How is the job different when you're not in your own space? It's really not different. I mean, you uh, you may approach it a little differently uh, from the safety aspect because. You're not sure of how a line may feed or or how mm. it may be. How it's laid uh, out. Laid out. Terrain, terrain may be different. Um, but most of the time, I mean, I I put a Finocchi's safety up against anybody's. Mm -hmm. And most of the places we go are the same. We're gonna we're gonna follow and they'll tell you mm -hmm. that. You know, you well, we don't do it. Rules. We don't do it that way here. Somewhere. Well, 
we go the extra mile, we do it this way, and they don't. They, there's never no disagreement. You do it the way that you need to do it. But yeah, that that's uh, that's pretty exciting. That's we'll talk about it. Talk about the, the the because it's the experience of getting there. Yeah, and working there. Get, getting there's a chore when you start moving that much equipment. Mm-hmm. Just to keep that that and much depending equipment on the together. magnitude of the storm. Yeah, too, depending you know? on the storm, depending on where you're going. Um, yeah, I still got. I make friends everywhere I go, Kentucky, Louisiana, because when you go there, you're trusting. They'll have a representative from their co-op. We call them bird dogs, and he leads us around. He's the guy that says, "Hey, this line feeds from this direction, and right here's an open switch, and we're gonna work on this section of line here." So then we take from that open switch and we put our grounds and we go to work. It's just the fact that and and the customers that you see that. Most of them can't pronounce our name. Yeah. <laughs> but they're like, man, where'd y'all come from? We said, we come from South Georgia. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, so, yeah, that that's a real exciting part of the job for me. Mm-hmm. I still love to go storm. I love I love the storm work. Lord, meet, meeting the new people. Well, the appreciation factor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, they, I mean, that's what I gather is yeah. the, you know. And the, when you go. You sent me pictures of signs and yeah. people coming out to hug your neck. and Yeah, they give you a little. We get all kind of stuff, and they it's just its amazing how the people treat you. And when you go, to, especially when you go to work for other co-ops, because I've worked as a contractor, it always wasn't that nice. But when you go as a co-op employee to another co-op, man, they're going to do their best to take care of you. Make sure you got a place to sleep. Make sure you got plenty of food. And all they want you to do is work and help them restore the power. Marcus, talk about when you go on storm call elsewhere. I mean— Roger said, "Sometimes you're sleeping in the truck. Sometimes you're, you're not. Talk, you know, talk about the the various conditions when you're responding to a major situation, weather situation elsewhere. How how do they approach that? What is the situation? Well, that's changed a lot over the years too. Uh, the one of the first ones that I went on was Hurricane Katrina, and uh, we stayed in someone's hunting camp. Oh, okay." <laughs> I think there was uh, 12 bunk beds in a one-room camp, and we had the whole place filled up. Okay. And uh, that was an, an interesting trip just to even get there. You know? I'm uh, sure. Uh, but uh, now they'll have uh, tent cities or uh, trailers trailers to sleep in. Sleeping or, trailers. We yeah. slept in trailers in South Florida on that last one last yeah. year. Yeah, or you know, you may be in motels if they have the the uh, availability and the, and the yeah, electricity. In the electricity, <laughs> sure. So, I mean, that's changed a lot over the years too. I guess in the beginning, we stayed wherever we could. Sometimes we'd have to drive an hour, or hour and a half oh, to wow. the nearest place where there was a motel or electricity. And uh, now it's tent cities most of the time. Yeah, if it's a major. If it's a major storm, most of the time it's it's a tent city. Uh, it's not like sleeping at home, but it's better than some conditions. Well, you know? and, and because when that happens, when you're on major storm, whether it's yeah there elsewhere or even on our own system, then the days are even longer. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. not it's not eight to five. You got just <laughs> enough time to to grab a meal, grab a sack for lunch tomorrow. At breakfast the next morning, you get, you know, sleep, get fuel. You still got fuel these trucks, and, uh, yeah, it makes for long days. It's generally 16-hour days. About 16-hour days. That's a long day. It's a long day. A lot of hard physical work in in between. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things we like to say about the cooperative difference, about being a a, a co-op, is that we are owned by – the very people that we we serve That's right. and that that want to that commitment that desire to work at, at home so to speak mm-hmm. is is what helps set us apart as an organization is is because we are serving our friends our neighbors our mm-hmm. family no, I agree. you know you do see people at the grocery store at the doctor's office at the little Ball league game. games or, right. or 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 whatever and i mean that that was definitely a strategic cooperative advantage. And I think mm-hmm. from your perspective, that still rings true today. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. 
just the the you know the knowing the people in your community and the people knowing you that you are working in your community is a is a, it's very rewarding. There's people on our system now who lived on our system who maybe the lineman's passed on and the widow still lives there and uh, she understands it because her husband did it for 40 years. And it's just very, it's rewarding when I get to go turn them lights on, you know? Mm -hmm. So finish this sentence. Being a lineman is not just a job, it's a... It's a reward. An adventure. That's kind of, I don't know, everybody says that, but... You'd be surprised at things you can that you see. Like Marcus said, being out there in the middle of the night, <laughs> everybody else is home in the bed. I mean, you run across all kind of things. Yeah, it's an adventure. Like you said, you have to have the want to. Yes. Because no situation is ever going to be like the one before. No, nope. mm, never, never. Well, on behalf of all of us at Okie Finoki, I extend, you know our appreciation for what you do for us every day and not just you two, all of our line linemen and, and crews and their commitment to serving our members. And thanks for taking the time today to give a little insight as what it's like from day to day. Thank you. Thank you.